Current distributions. We start off with what I'm calling a point current. And I may be the only person in the world to mention something like a point current because that doesn't make much sense. And I'm doing this to draw an analogy with what we did for electrostatics, where we started off with a point charge, then progressed to the line charge, sheet charge, volume charge. And so we're starting with a point current, and it is the pure form of the bo savar law where we're not yet integrating. And we have this tiny little differential current element that induces a differential magnetic field around it. So if there was a point current, I think this would be it. Now, if we look at a line current, we will integrate this differential current element, if you will, over the length of that line to get the total magnetic field intensity. Now, if we do this for a wire of infinite length, we get a very nice solution. It is the current divided by two pi and the distance you're observing the magnetic field from the wire. And what direction is the magnetic field? Well, it's circulating around this wire. So in cylindrical coordinates, that would be the phi direction. So this is the answer for an infinite length wire. And then in the examples, we will derive that. We'll also derive it for a finite length wire. Let's move on now to a surface current. So on a surface, we'll have a little differential surface area, ds. And we're describing the surface current density as a vector capital K. It's a vector because now that we have a surface, this current could go you know, lower left to upper right. It could go from lower right to upper left, and it can go in any direction. So the surface current density has to be a vector quantity. And it has units of amps per meter. Let's figure out the magnetic field due to a surface current. And so we're drawing the surface current over on the left. And just imagine this, this copperish colored thing is of infinite extent. We will write Ampere circuit law, which is a closed contour line integral of H dot DL. And we're going to define a surface that encompasses a piece of the surface current and then integrate around it. So what we'll do is we'll integrate from A to B, B to zero, zero to C, C to D, D to zero, and zero to A. That's a total of six integrals, which we're writing this way. So we've just broken up Ampere circuit law into six separate integrals around this path that we've chosen encompassing, encompassing some piece of our current element. So I've repeated the integral here from the previous slide. Let's think about each one of these individually. Well, we start at point A. We'll integrate from A to B. We're going in the positive x direction, so we have a positive sign out, out front. And what is that? Well, we're just going to write it as the x component of h because we have a dot product here, h dot dl, and dl is in the x direction. So we're only able to look at the x component of the magnetic field on the top of this uh, surface current device, this current element. And the length of this is delta w. So this first integral from a to b is just hx on the top times delta w. Now we'll integrate from this point B down to zero. At this point, we're going in the negative Z direction. So we'll need a negative sign out in front of this term. We're doing an H dot DL. Our differential length is in the Z direction. So in this case, we're only listening to the Z component of the magnetic field on the top of this current element. And then what's the length? Well, from B to zero, if the total height of this rectangle is delta H, then B to zero is just delta H over two. Then we integrate from zero to C. We're still going in the negative direction. We still have a negative sign. We're still going in the Z direction. So we're listening to the Z component of the magnetic field intensity, but now we're on the bottom of our current element. And just like above, the length of that integration is delta H over two. Now we're integrating from C over to D. Well, that's in the negative X direction. So we have a negative sign out in front of this term. 
It's a dot product of DL. Our differential length is in the X direction. So now we're listening to the X component of the magnetic field on the bottom or below this current element. And then what's the length? Well, we're going the full delta W. So we have a delta W in here. And two more integrations left. We're going from point D up to zero. This is the positive Z direction. So we have a positive sign now. Our dot product, our differential length is in the Z direction. So we're listening to the Z component of the magnetic field, but we're still below the current element. So we're still on the bottom. And what's the length of that integration? Well, it's delta H over two. And then the last integration, we're going from zero up to A. We're in the positive Z direction, so we have a positive sign. Our differential length is in the Z direction, so we're listening to the Z component of the magnetic field, but now on the top side of that current element. And what's the length? Well, zero to A, that is half of this vertical height, delta H, so it's delta H over two. Now, if in the limit, as this delta H goes to zero and this rectangle closes in on that surface, four of our terms vanish. And we're just left with two terms. We're left with the X component of the magnetic field on the top and the bottom. Let's think about this. We know that due to symmetry, the magnetic field has to be the same magnitude on the top and the bottom. Well, if they're the same magnitude, would this subtraction give us zero and we end up with zero current? Well, that doesn't make any sense because we know that there's current flowing along the surface. We said so, we've declared that. So while the magnitudes are equal, the answer has to be that they're negative sign. And so we're going to let the magnetic field below the line have the negative sign. So if the magnetic field below has a negative sign, we can write this equation this way. We'll just put in HX. That's really representing the magnitude of the field. We can also think of this as the field above the current element. What was a subtraction now becomes an addition because what was on the bottom was a subtraction. And now we can add these terms together and we get the current is two times the X component of the magnetic field times Delta W. We can arrive at the total current flowing through, through the inside of this blue loop a different way. If we know the current density, and we do, that's capital K, and we know we just need to listen to the Y component is flowing in the purely Y direction through a width of delta W, then the total current has to be KY times delta W. Well, on the previous slide, we derived total current a different way. That was two times HX delta W. Here we arrived at it a different way. So we can solve this for KY by just simply dividing both sides by delta W and we end up with KY equals two HX. So in vector form, we can write it this way. Our magnetic field is one half, right? Because we would bring this two over to the other side, one half K, and it's the cross product with the vector normal. Notice we have a KY and an HX. They are perpendicular to each other. And so it turns out that will come from the cross product. So K cross the surface normal divided by two gives us the magnetic field around a surface current. And then the last thing, a volume current. Uh, we're integrating this JDV, that's the electric current density from Maxwell's equations that we've talked about a bunch and our scalar differential volume. Otherwise the argument inside the integrals unchanged, we just have now a triple integral because we're integrating over a volume. So our differential current element now has units of amp meters. And of course our electric current density, our volume current density has units of amps per meter squared. And I kind of think of that as in being in the cross section of this conductor.